What is pressure fermentation that everyone is talking about? And is it even any good? Well, let's find out. So pressure fermentation is the method to ferment beer under applied pressure. In a standard homebrew fermenter, which is mostly a pale bucket or a glass carboy, the carbon dioxide that's produced during fermentation is allowed to escape through an airlock, which prevents all the external matter from getting into the fermenter and lets the carbon dioxide escape the fermenter. So the pressure inside the fermenter is always maintained at atmospheric pressure or 1 atm. So in a pressure fermenter, such as one of these, there is no airlock. So pressure fermentation is a technique in which the carbon dioxide that's produced during fermentation is allowed to be captured inside the fermenter. So over time, as more and more carbon dioxide is produced, all of it accumulates inside the fermenter and starts exerting pressure onto the fermenting medium. In this case, the wort or the beer that's inside the fermenter. So they say there are a number of advantages to fermenting under pressure, such as getting an overall clean flavor profile from the yeast due to low production of esters, fusel alcohols, and other secondary yeast metabolites, and also the ability to ferment at a higher temperature, which in theory should lead to a faster fermentation time. The question here is that does low level of esters necessarily mean a better tasting beer? And does fermenting under pressure lead to a faster fermentation time and still produce a good tasting beer? Well, we'll find out today by running an experiment in which we'll compare two different fermentations happening simultaneously or side by side, in which one of the fermentations will be done in a pressure fermenter applying external pressure, and the other one will be done in a standard homebrewing way using an airlock in which the fermentation occurs at atmospheric pressure. In the end, we will compare the ester profiles of both the beers and uh, do a sensory analysis to see which one tastes better. And then we will also compare the kinetics or how fast the fermentation occurred in both the cases to see which one is a more efficient way of fermenting beer to save you time. So without further ado, let's get brewing. So the recipe that I'll be using for this experiment will be a pale ale. Why a pale ale, you might ask? Well, that's because a pale ale is one of the only beer styles, or one of the few beer styles, that tastes really good with a clean fermentation profile without any esters. But it also tastes bloody good if you put the esters in a desirable quantity such that they play with the hop compounds and complement the hop profile of the beer. If you're interested in the recipe, you can find it in the description box below. Uh, it's a single hop recipe. Today I'll be using Idaho hops just because I've been recently in love with Idaho hops. But if you want to swap it out for another hop, it should be fairly easy to adjust that in your own version of the recipe. So we're starting off with about 41.5, 42 liters of striped water heated at 68 degree Celsius. I don't know if you guys can see it there. So the mash is underway. Today we're mashing at 65 degrees Celsius for a total of 60 minutes. That's a fair bit of time, so we have time to do some research on how pressure fermentation actually works. We know we're expecting a low ester profile and a faster fermentation time, 
but it's essential to understand how that actually works and the answer to that lies beneath the cell wall so let's have a look so what lies beneath the cell wall inside the cell there are multiple chemical reactions that form complex metabolic pathways in the cell each pathway has a starting point known as the reactant and a finishing point known as the products for this experiment, we only need to consider two main metabolic pathways. So let's declutter this diagram by eliminating the pathways that we would not consider in this experiment. Now that the image looks less scary, let's focus on the two pathways of relevance. The first one is sugar metabolism, also known as glycolysis. The second one is amino acid metabolism, also known as Ehrlich pathway. For each of these pathways, a number of intermediate products are formed along the way. But we only need to focus on the final products formed. For sugar synthesis, the final products formed are ethanol and acetic acid, as well as a small quantity of fatty acids. It is important to note that the amount of ethanol produced is much higher as compared to acetic acid and fatty acids formed due to sugar metabolism. The second pathway, which is amino acid synthesis, has a number of intermediaries as well but the final product that is formed is higher alcohols. Now this could be a group of higher alcohols such as isoamyl alcohol, isobutyl alcohol, so on and so forth. Since we do not need to consider the intermediate products formed, let's also remove them from the image to simplify it even further. As you can see, the fatty acids formed during sugar synthesis combines with the higher alcohol formed during amino acid synthesis to form an ester. Now this ester is formed from fatty acids that are slightly longer in their chain size. As a result, the esters do not easily release into the media or in the surrounding wort from the yeast cells and are hardly found in the finished beer. On the other hand, acetic acid is also a fatty acid, but it is a short chain fatty acid which can easily move from inside of the yeast cell to outside of the yeast cell into the surrounding media which is the beer in this case. Acetic acid combines with ethanol, which is the most readily available alcohol in beer, and forms ethyl acetate, which is the most abundant ester found in beer as well. Ethyl acetate tastes like solvent and is not a desirable flavor profile to have in a beer, so to minimize the production of ethyl acetate is highly desirable. Now some of the acetic acid also reacts with higher alcohols to form a family of esters. The kind of ester formed depends on the kind of higher alcohol involved in the reaction. For example, isoamyl alcohol, which is a higher alcohol, reacts with acetic acid to form isoamyl acetate. Isoamyl acetate usually donates a banana or bubblegum-like flavor to the beer. Now if the higher alcohol involved is isobutyl alcohol, the acetate formed will be isobutyl acetate. Isobutyl acetate donates a pineapple-like flavor to the beer. Now there are many esters like this and all of them would, com would contribute a fruity profile to the beer. So they are desirable in certain quantities depending on the beer style and the aim of that specific beer. Now wouldn't it be cool if you could control the formation of these esters to get a desirable flavor profile in your beer? Well to a certain degree you can. There are a number of parameters which we can change in order to control the amount of esters formed during fermentation. The first one is temperature. An increase in temperature speeds up all the chemical reactions involved within the yeast cell. As a result, more amount of ethanol is produced, more amount of acetic acid is produced, more esters and more higher alcohol are produced, and they are also produced at a faster rate as compared to normal temperature. Since ethanol is already produced in much higher quantities as compared to the other compounds, the increase in quantity of ethanol is hardly noticeable. However, the rate at which ethanol is formed or the speed of ethanol formation is much quicker and quite easily noticeable under increased temperature. On the other hand, compounds such as esters and higher alcohols contribute majority of the flavor to the beer, both good and bad. So even a slight increase in the quantity of production of these compounds is easily detected by humans. This is because of the low flavor threshold that humans have for these chemical compounds. The second parameter that we can use to control production of these compounds is pressure. With an increase in pressure, the quantity of acetic acid, esters and higher alcohols decrease. Ethanol remains pretty much unimpacted by an increase in pressure. This is because ethanol is a primary metabolite and already produced in much higher quantities compared to the other metabolites 
and does not have an overall effect on its production levels. So what happens if we combine an increase in pressure with an increase in temperature? Well, the rate at which ethanol is produced increases due to an increase in temperature. However, the increase in acetic acid, esters and higher alcohol levels is balanced out or cancelled out due to an increase in pressure. As a result, in theory, pressure fermentation allows for fermenting at a higher temperature which in return increases the speed of fermentation and cancels out all the negative effects that you get from fermenting at a higher temperature such as production of esters and other off flavors. So it's pretty much a win-win situation, leading to a faster and cleaner fermentation profile. Hmm, that's some cool stuff, eh? Now that we know about how pressure fermentation works and how the yeast behaves under pressure, we can continue back with our brew day and look, it's almost time for the mash out. So I'll raise up the temperature, get the grains out, give it a sparge, and then we will wrap up to the boil. Alright, so the wort has been cooled and added to the fermenters. Now I'm just oxygenating both the fermenters with the same amount of oxygen so that isn't a variable in our experiment and we get a consistent or identical wort in both the fermenters. After accounting for all the brewing losses, I got about 15 liters of wort in each of the fermenters. The fermenter on the left hand side is going to be fermented at ambient pressure and at 18 degrees Celsius and the fermenter on the right will be fermented at 10 psi pressure and a higher temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. So here I'm just adjusting the spunding valve setting it to 10 psi and this will go on the right fermenter and for our ambient pressure fermenter I will just connect a dip tube to the gas outlet of the fermenter King Jr. The yeast that I'm using for this experiment is USO5, so the temperatures for both these fermentation experiments should be within the ideal or optimum fermentation temperature range for the yeast strain. Uh, USO5 ferments pretty well at 18 degrees as well as 22 degrees Celsius, so it'll be interesting to compare the results in the end. So all that's left to do now is tuck these two fermenters away and I'll see you in a couple weeks time. Good day guys, this is day 6 after the brew day, so 6 days into fermentation and we are at 75% completion towards our expected um, attenuation. So it's time to dry hop both the bees. So I thought I'll just do a quick video on how to dry hop a beer that's fermenting under pressure in order to minimize the oxygen intake and preserve the hop compounds. So today I'll be dry hopping with about 65 grams of Idaho hops per fermenter or about 3.47 grams per litre. Now my fermenters have a floating dip tube so I do not like to add the hops in directly just because they can block the dip tube. So I like to add um, the hops in a hop sock. So first I'll be adding the hops in the fermenter on the right which are fermented at ambient pressure so it should already be um, depressurized and easy to open. So nothing really fancy here, all we gotta do is open the lid, uh, add the hops and close it as quickly as possible to minimize the oxygen intake. Now if you do have a um, gas cylinder, you can purge the headspace by putting in some additional CO2 after you've added the hops. Now for the pressure fermenter, 
uh, it already has about 10 psi of pressure that accumulated during fermentation. So I'll take the uh, spunding valve off and then uh, use the um, relief valve to vent out all the existing pressure so it's safe to open. Then I'll quickly open the lid again and then add the hops in the hop sock. Close the lid as soon as I can and minimize the oxygen that gets taken up in the first place. Then I'll purge the headspace by adding some CO2 from the cylinder, but I'll connect the CO2 um, cylinder to the liquid post so the CO2 bubbles through the solution and pushes any oxygen that entered the fermenter uh, further upwards. Then I will open the relief valve um, to let the oxygen gas and carbon dioxide gas mixture to escape the headspace of the fermenter, ensuring that our fermenter is completely free of oxygen. All right, so the fermentation is complete for both the beers. I've gone ahead and packaged two samples, one for pressure fermentation and one for ambient fermentation of both the beers in these tiny little falcon tubes. I'll take these with me to the lab and test for some esters and VDKs and other chemical compounds and then see how they compare on a molecular or, or on a chemical level. Uh, the results will take about a week to get back to me, so we'll do that comparison probably in the next video. We'll also go through the kinetics of both the uh, fermentations in which we compare the tilt graphs of um, both the fermentations and see how fast or how slow um, uh, it went and how it reacted to the changes in temperature, pressure, so on and so forth. And then finally, we'll obviously do a sensory analysis in which we taste both the beers and see how our palate um, you know, reacts to both the beers, um, how it's perceived, what notes we can pick up, um, and then make a final verdict about whether pressure fermentation is a better option or not, or you should just stick to normal fermentation and still get the same results. So if you feel you learned uh, a little bit from this video about how pressure fermentation works and if it contributed uh, yeah, in a positive manner to your home brewing um, journey and your home brewing experience, you know, drop a like, subscribe, it helps me a lot, and ring that bell so you never miss any of the videos that I release. The part two for this video will be out next week, so keep an eye out for it, and I'll catch you guys next time. Cheers.